Hello world! Here with me today is a brilliant leader who brought the world a second to none leading social media analytics and listening company back in 2007 and lives to tell his tale. A man who needs no introduction, please welcome the man, the myth, the legend, Giles Palmer, founder and CEO of Brandwatch and current chief growth officer at Cision. Giles, welcome to the show. Are you ready to get radically transparent with me? 100%. Thank you for that incredible introduction. <laughs> Fantastic. I've been waiting for this conversation uh, for weeks um, because you are quite a celebrity in the social media world. And I would love to get a brief look, if you could, into your professional journey because I know it's quite unique. Um, and how you actually found yourself, one, you know, how did you birth Brandwatch? And two, how did you find yourself as chief growth officer at Cision today? That's a long story, but I'm happy to tell it. Um, yeah. So where would you like me to start? Or is there a question that you'd like me to answer? Like, so maybe, maybe taking a look back at kind of just a nugget of how you got started in this world. Because if I did some correct Googling, it was not exactly your, you didn't study this. No, I didn't study this. <laughs> um, I didn't study this. I'm not sure there was this to study when I was studying. So I'm, uh, I, I was born in the sixties. I'm 52. So, uh, when I'm radically 52, transparent now, <laughs> I know I've got all my filters on. Um, uh, when I was going through university in the late eighties, early nineties, the internet didn't exist. Um, so and programming was like i learned to program on this language called fortran which is just like ancient um uh there, there i did have a computer when i was a kid i had a, this thing called a bbc micro and i used to write you know programs in basic which were just terrible um i probably used it more for gaming than programming although i can do some revisionist history oh yeah i programmed at 11 like all the other uh <laughs> the other like brilliant um computer program entrepreneurs anyway i did a physics degree i learned to program um, I was terrible at it. I didn't find it particularly interesting. Um, uh, I left university and I was like, what am I going to do now? I had no clue. So um, I trained as an accountant, which was um, insanely dull. Um, well, it was for me. Some other people love it, but I didn't. And I was terrible at it. Um, it was kind of looking inside companies and looking historically. Like there was nothing creative about it. Um, in fact, creative accounting is a bad thing you are discouraged from being creative if you're an accountant so so i i actually think that um i learned i found out about, about my inner creativity my inner tracy emin uh in my 30s really so so it, the the whole journey frankly from you know processed meat from a kind of second tier no i won't say the second tier english private school because of my school would not like that but like not one of the kind of Glory, you know, not eaten and that kind of thing. Like a, a, a private school in Bristol, I, my parents, my dad did really well. He was a working class guy. He did really well. He put me and my sister through private education. I was smart enough at school to get to a decent university. I did physics, which I found quite dull. Then I became an accountant, really dull. Um, so in my early twenties, I was like this kind of inside, I didn't feel like what, what, what how I'd been educated. Um, so basically in my twenties, I got drunk a lot and, um, was irresponsible and just an idiot, um, but bounced from one job to another, not really liking them very much. I went into industry as a trained accountant. I hated that. And eventually in my late twenties, so it's not, it's not really, it's not really good start this story, is it? Anyway, in my late twenties, I, um, I, I, I kind of, that was when the internet was like emerging. Yeah. Um, I didn't know anything about internet, pr uh, programming, you know, I discovered net, net, net bait not at least that's one of our competitors um netscape <laughs> on, tell. Uh, yeah i discovered one of our competitors no no i discovered netscape i think around about 98 something like that and i had you know i was typing something into the address bar i was like what the hell is this I've, i had no idea what i was doing um but anyway i joined sky uh and sky was going digital sky's a tv program a tv company they were going digital so there was this big software project to take the analog set top box and make it digital. And, and that was a big time, thing back then. That was a that was big huge. thing. Interactive TV was a, was a thing in the nineties, the late nineties. Yeah. And, and Sky wanted to put um, uh, 
commerce on the TV. So you could buy your shopping through through the TV. There was it was a 9.8 kilobit modem in 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 the box. Like you know, it was thousands of times slower than current broadband. So you can imagine trying to buy shopping with a 9.8 kilobit mm -hmm. modem. It was just like torture. So that was never going to work. Um, and the internet was, you know, just steamrolling in interactive TV. The internet was this kind of emerging global thing. And Sky was trying to create this like little parochial, well, I had 3 million subscribers, but it was like, you know, their own tech and all of this sort of stuff. Anyway, so I was there, I was in charge of business planning. Um, and then I started a little company uh, at the age of 29. I kind of was so kind of bored, I guess, and, and, uh, and, frustrated by being kind of shoehorned into this kind of corporate world that I elected personally, I elected to go into it, but I was just like, I just felt like a fish out of water. And then, and then I started this little company with another guy called Jeremy and, and we, uh, and we were going to sell stuff through the TV. We were going to sell perfumes and cosmetics. Through oh. the TV. We knew nothing about this stuff, but, but there was a, but the sky needed a company to do this. And we thought, Oh, well, we'll start this company and we'll do it. So we put in a bit of money. We hired some buyers from Liberty and QVC, two really wonderful women called Helen and Kate. And we brought in a, a, a developer to build the back end, a guy called Steve. Um, and the five of us kind of created this little company called, called five senses. It didn't, it, we raised some money. There was this kind of crazy story. We, we, we raised one and a half million dollars in, in six weeks. Like we were a bunch of kids. We had a business plan basically. And we managed to raise this money. Jeremy, uh, Jeremy's was father was part of kind of Jeremy's from a Jewish family. And, and he had these kind of friends who were all wealthy Jewish <laughs> businessmen. And I kind of like, we started pitching to them and it, we had some incredible, like crazy pitches. Um, and, uh, just mad mad crazy stuff and eventually we got this money basically the world the guy that makes the 75 percent of the world's candles said that he would um he would put in seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. we met this guy in claridge's never met him before pitched to him he was like he said um amazing guy he's called bob gergen and he goes i love your energy you remind me of me when i was your age no. how much are you guys looking for and we said a million and a half he goes put me down for 750 talk to my guy he can sort out the details and we were like oh my god we were 29 years old we went down the pub and smoked a big cigar you know it was just ridiculous it was so much fun and at that point I kind of thought I can't go back into corporate world this is just way too much fun the team loved working together we had we created energy we it was just it was just brilliant and we were making it up we were creating stuff and and I realized immediately this is what i need to do i I'm, I'm done with corporate stuff i'm done with education education which basically killed the love of learning for me it was like anti-education i love learning now but i hated it in my 20s um and and so i i thought okay i'm gonna start you know we we we, we kind of went for this business in the end the deal with sky fell through so we never took the money from bob gergen or anybody else um uh, and the whole business kind of crumbled within three months but it was the catalyst, the spark, the the thing which basically made me realize, well, uh, I'm I'm gonna I'm an entrepreneur. I mean, I can say that now. I didn't I didn't you know that's not what I thought at the time. I didn't think I'm an entrepreneur. No, I didn't think that. I just thought I'm I want to start a business. So Steve and I, the guy at the back end, the developer, um, uh, started this company called Runtime Collective. Basically, a bunch of uh, guys, uh, nearly all guys. There was one, 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 one woman who joined early who had this kind of like a utopian idea about using open source software and changing the world and everybody would be paid the same. And it was all like, you know, complete kind of hippie wonderland. And I was like all in on this. Um, I remember telling my dad about this and my dad was like, sounds a bit strange, Giles, but you know, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we soon realized quite quickly that Paying people, everybody the same doesn't really scale. It doesn't. It doesn't really work because some people are more valuable and work harder than others. And when they, and then when everybody knows that everybody's paid the same, and the guy that's like doing more of the work and making more profit for the company is like, why is he getting paid as much as me again? Can you just explain mm -hmm. that to me? So so that happened quite quickly, and so we learned a ton about you know how to go from some some utopic sort of collective to a company. 
and we built systems for people and we did loads of stuff over the five years we learned how to build software um which okay. in a professional way which was which was kind of interesting all internet-based software and then in 2006 i kind of thought right i want to i want to build a product company of the four founders of runtime collective Two, one gone in back into academia, another one is uh, writing his own computer language. These are brilliant, brilliant human beings. Um, Steve, the, 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 the developer that I mentioned before, he went off, he wanted to join Google and okay. go into strategy at Google. So I was like, right, well, I'm going to build a product company. So uh, we, I had this idea uh, for Brandwatch. We were speaking with a couple of friends. We had this idea, um, came up with a name, like, and then, and then built it. And 15 years later, we sold it so that's the story um but it was that moment that moment of leaving sky and and doing a crazy thing and going on that adventure that made me realize that i wanted to create something i'm basically fundamentally like we all are a creative person and i get joy and pleasure uh from creating things rather than managing assets managing things i like creating um and um, and that's that's it. That's the um, that's the story. That, that's the story. And anyone listening in, if you hear a screaming toddler, that would be mine. Um, so apologies <laughs> there if you can hear that. Um, but something as you're telling your story that I really appreciate is the fact that throughout all of this, right, throughout your 20s and and you know early 30s, you were being authentically you. And I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Um, but what I want to ask throughout all of this, right, and even today, I'm sure. There's been a lot that you've learned, but as a leader now in the industry, what's keeping you up at night now, professionally, you know, uh, in terms of what you do or what you're building or where you are? Um, I think that authentic question is a, is a point is a really good one. We should definitely come back to that because uh, authenticity to, to be yourself you need to you need to have a degree of self-confidence and a degree of feeling like being yourself is is okay but also having the idea that i can improve myself so it's not like oh i'm fixed and it's okay to be me actually no i want to improve and i want to listen and get feedback and so on. so let's come back to that but um because i think it's really important um the the what's keeping me up at night right now uh well i've got a new job like i've got a boss for the first time in 15 years um uh <laughs> i've got I, I don't know what i don't know about the company that i've joined um i've given given this role chief growth officer and that's a somewhat ambiguous title and sort of deliberately so as i kind of find my place in this organization and what i can do and how i can be helpful you know and then there's the whole you know, this is 5,000 people. This is 10 times bigger than Brandwatch. And and 500 people was already quite a lot to kind of manage and, and be on top of. So you find yourself getting more and more distant from what's actually happening, you know, where the rubber hits the road, either in product development or working with customers and so on. So so that's challenging. And, you know, I'm adjusting and I'm, and I'm trying to um, figure out if this fits with, with me and, and 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 I'm learning as well, right? I'm I'm learning stuff, and that's kind of good because I love learning. Um, I do now. Um, so yeah, I, I I guess I and then there's the kind of post sale weird thing, which is like you know you've sold your company. What does that mean? You know, so what? Uh, is that a good thing? Is it a bad thing? There's this kind of celebration of exits, but exits are also endings and endings are weird and 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 somewhat traumatic so i'm going through i'm going through all of that and and then there's broader stuff around society and data privacy and what you know big tech companies getting more and more power and that's i'm not sure i'm super happy about that personally um so there's all that sort of stuff and i'm i love politics so i you know I get obsessed with all of that sort of stuff. So basically, I'm tr I'm trying to actually reduce the amount of stuff that I'm I'm thinking about and it goes through my head because it's uh yeah, this, is, this is I've got this kind of monkey mind issue of like everything is just like oh, oh and I need to just, <laughs> let's take it down let's take it down a bit. So so I guess I'm trying to calm myself down a bit. <laughs> 
I guess is the answer. So, so, so yeah, mon monkey minds, uh, they can be exciting, fun, and, and a place where creativity really fosters, but it also <laughs> one that keeps you up and uh, can be hard to settle. Maybe yoga, meditation. And hard um, to live with, right? You know, I mean, <laughs> to live with. Live with me, I, was, I drive them crazy. So uh, exactly. that's all good. Exactly. So I want to hop back to authenticity because as you were telling your story, I think so many of us can relate to that, right? You're kind of thrown into a society that at 18, you've got to know what you need, you know, what are you going to do for the rest of your life? And it's, I don't know, right? And and throughout this entire process, as you were telling your story, to me, all I heard was you were so authentically you and you brought that to Brandwatch and you brought that to who you are today. And I think in the society that we live in today, there's a very fine balance that organizations seem to need to be striking I'm not sure how successfully we've been at it, but we've entered a world filled with accountability and inclusion. And it's exciting times. I think it's incredible to see these changing times and be a part of it, but it's very different from other generations of work, such as our parents or maybe the ones that we were raised in. And I'm curious to know, as you're building out your teams today, even at Brandwatch when you were there, you know, building that, how are you balancing accountability and inclusivity in your organization? And what do you see as some of the biggest challenges in achieving that balance? Loaded question. <laughs> big question, big question. So I'm a white middle-aged man, uh, you know, um, not really flavor of the month uh, in, in kind of globally and, and understandably so, you know, um, if we look at the history of how, you know, older white men have behaved, probably not so great. Um, so not probably, definitely. Um, so it's time for change and that change is important and it's happening, I think, pretty quickly. But then I'm older, so I have a different kind of time span horizon to say, my kids, I've got two young daughters and a young son. I say young, they're in their uh, late teens, early 20s. So they're, they're, they're getting into this kind of place where I was at, which is what am I going to do with my life? Um, and I had no clue at their age either. Um, and I see, you know, my daughters in particular kind of actually more, way more empowered than say my sister was at, at, at their age. My sister's an amazing woman, but she wasn't like she didn't have an ambitious like career drive um and i think that was partly because of the society that she grew up in i mean we were treated exactly the same as kids like we we played competitive tennis and she was actually for her age and gender better than me and you know competed nationally and played for england um and she's a she's an amazing strong strong woman and we yeah, as I said, like we were brought up that their gender wasn't, I didn't feel a thing like it was a thing in my household when we were younger. She was more popular at my school than, than I was, for example. Um, <laughs> no, that's another thing, actually. That's another, another episode. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, so she's a, an amazing young woman, but um, or uh, now middle aged woman, but um, the, it's, it's an interesting time. It, you know, I've struggled with adjust, maybe not adjusting because I don't feel like I was a dinosaur, but um like really thinking about my privilege and what has allowed me to get to where I'm at which has got nothing to do with me personally um you know it's the fact that the the, the society is tilted towards men if nothing else because we don't have to have children and we don't take time off from our careers in our 30s and uh, or for or you know 20s 30, 30s and uh, and then struggle with 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 bringing up children as much. That's changing, uh, which is great. Um, but you know, there's the biology is different. So, so it's it's been it's been a really interesting couple of years. And we brought in uh, a, a young woman called Abba to to run diversity and inclusion for us, and and she is appropriately you know a firebrand, which is great. And she's like you know, you don't know what you don't know. You have privilege. Let's talk about that. I'm like, okay, here are the 10, here are the 10 signs of privilege. How many of you got Giles? Hmm, nine or eight, like a lot. And so, so it's, a, and I've read a lot of books around in, in the last couple of years. So it's been a time of reflection and thought. And, and it, this is fantastic. But at the same time, <clears throat> being yourself 
and being your authentic self when you know that you need to change um, and adapt and you know uh, learn is actually kind of a challenging thing to do right because like I've got instincts and things that I've been built up over 50 years and it's like and actually some of those are pretty funky and they need changing and it's like oh who's me where's the authentic me in all of this and and actually it's it, it's an interesting place uh, for all of us, right? But especially older white guys uh, who 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 really need to take a deep breath and take a look around and realize how fortunate they are, uh, we are. So and adjust their behavior accordingly. Um, so it's um, yeah, it's I don't know the answer to this. I try I try to just be, you know be open and honest and also thoughtful but then there's this idea that if there's something in my head that I feel I'm not sure whether I should say it or not and then and then that's the that that's the kind of authentic sort of break right there because you're like actually I'm I don't, I'm not quite sure who I'm being right now I'm, I'm kind of not saying what I want to say because I'm scared to say it because it might I might be judged badly or something like that and that is an interesting thing to wrestle with i think it's an important thing to wrestle with but it is a, it isn't it is a change to how maybe i was 10 years ago where i would just say stuff and and of course people would cringe and my you know and there was a jazz i can't believe you said that and and and, I, and now looking back at some of the things i did say 10 years ago i think no i can't believe i said that shit either but and i shouldn't have and i was thoughtless and so on well, but what's interesting about what it's, you're it's, saying? It's, it's a tricky one, isn't it? I don't know the answer to this. It's tricky, but you know what? All like you know, I, I've been following you for a long time without seeming like a stalker because I think the, the work that you're doing is phenomenal, and the teams that you're building is phenomenal. Um, but when I when you think also about that balance, right? The world we live in, the work world, the startup, the entrepreneur world—it's all about super high performance, right? High and, growth, 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 growth. growth. So how do you work with your teams in this new world of kind of accepting and being not ju not judgmental and balancing you know inclusivity how do you work with your teams so that you can call out poor performance without calling out that an individual is a poor person or not a perform not performing to where they you feel they need to be does that question make sense yeah it makes total sense I mean, I'd like to think, and I've worked with some people. Um, uh, I'll call out a guy I used to work with, who's and he's an he absolute perfect example of this guy called Brian Tukey. Is you lead by example. He led by like extraordinary example. He was our COO for many years, and I used to say to him, like, you know, that you really annoy me, Brian, because you're such an incredible human being, and you live, you work in such an amazing way you make you make me feel bad about myself, about myself. <laughs> um I, me I meant it tongue in cheek but he was it, he is an extraordinary guy um and you know you try and live up to standards of performance behavior that you want to see in others but of course that slips and you say something stupid or you're judgy about something or or you uh, me for me i'm in, i'm 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 quite impatient and um and that's quite a hard emotion to live with because, you know, you just, oh, I can't fucking believe that this is, why, why haven't you done this yet? Or, you know, and then you go into judgy mode because it's like, why haven't you done this? Like if I was doing it, I would have done it quicker. And then it becomes quite a difficult internal dialogue. And then, and, and of course, when you're being, when you're being, when you're a leader and, you, and, and you're somewhat kind of on show, it, it's pretty obvious what you're feeling and for, for me as well I've never really been able to hide how I feel about stuff so so then 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 you you have that the fallout of that is like somebody's feeling they feel they know how you feel about them and, and then you've got to unpick all of that and it's like oh shit so then so when, when you're when you're small when there's like 30 or 40 of you you're in it together you know each other there's a tightness of the group and 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 then there's a forgiveness because you know each other and, and and that knowing each other kind of warts and all there's an acceptance and that's really actually a wonderful wonderful feeling it's like it's what it's what people like me who've, who've got built bigger companies look back at the you know the early days and reminisce like when it was just the the 20 of us and 
and we were a band of brothers and sisters and we all knew each other super well you know we ignore the stuff that the business was a on fire half the time and you know we were struggling to get any customers or whatever we ignore all that stuff we just remember the how we felt and the connections with the other people when you get to 500 you can't it's not like that so so what we did which um we became more professional i guess is the simplest way of saying it we got uh professional coaches in we followed strategic frameworks we got a bit more disciplined in making sure that it was less things were less personal mm -hmm. and not about you and me. It was about us as a professional team working together to actually um, hit, you know, get to where we wanted to get to. But in order to do that, you need to be really clear about where you want to get to lay out all the steps. And that's that, that's hard work that takes time, attention, um, like dedicated brain cycles as a team to get to know each other, come up with the plan, come up with the strategy, figure out how that divvies up between each department, figure out how you're going to keep on track and then just step into it. It's like, it's, it's, it's really hard work and, and it doesn't, you know, people don't talk about it as hard work, but I, I find that hard work, I but that, that's, yeah, that's the only way. Yeah. You know, no, you know, I, it's, I, it's collective I, ownership. Yeah. Yeah. It's certainly collective ownership and uh, something that you mentioned earlier, right? You, you mentioned earlier in the, the episode, that you know in the beginning of your 20s you weren't and you know the k through 12 not so much of a you know loving to study and loving school and then you've kind of morphed that and i'm curious to ask today what are where are some of the places or the influencers or the authors or the publications that you're looking at to one that inspires you or interests you that you find interesting about the industry or two that you read on a pretty consistent basis it doesn't necessarily have to be in the industry. Yeah. So I like to read novels, um, like physically. I mean, I, I don't have a Kindle, but I think that would be the same. So um, my partner bought me uh, a Kurt Vonnegut book the other day called The Sirens of Titan, which is just hysterical and amazing. So I read I read a lot of novels. Um, I kind of go through cycles where I'm like, like really intensely reading, a, you know, a book a week. And then I'll go a month or two without reading anything. So I kind of putting out the that. fires in the real yeah, world. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I kind of, I, I, I guess I've got a bit of an addictive personality. So when I get into something, I really get into it. And then, but it takes me a little while to get into something. So once I start a book and get into it, I have to finish it like really quickly. But then it might take me a while to get to the next one. But I listen to a lot of stuff, podcasts okay. and um, audio books. So I listened to How to Fail by Elizabeth Day just recently, which is a fabulous, fabulous book. Uh, brilliant, brilliantly feminine as well, written by a woman from a woman's point of view and just a brilliant listen um, for men and women. I think it will give women confidence and it will give men and it educate, it's educational for men into how, into the life of a young woman and what she's gone through. And she and she's fabulous. So so that's one. I'm listening to a podcast called Philosophize This right now. Um, uh, Stephen, uh, I can't remember his name. Um, anyway, Philosophize This is a po podcast. Uh, there's about 170 episodes, and each <laughs> one's 25 minutes. It is the history of philosophy. And the, I say the for someone who like, likes politics, I feel like politics and philosophy really go hand in hand. So for someone who likes I politics, totally, that would be a good I one. I totally agree. I totally agree. So I'm now at the, I've got past the Renaissance and I'm into the kind of the 19th century um, uh, philosophy, philosophers. So that's super interesting. Um, so I kind of, I, I mow the lawn, I listen to philosophy podcasts. I walk around the house, I listen to an audio book. My partner, Katya, is like, drives her crazy because I'm walking around with these headphones on because I kind of feel like I, I think I need stimulation more than most people. So I, so I love kind of just getting inputs. Um, and she's like, you're never here. You're on the bloody headphones the whole time. So I'm like, oh, take the headphones off. Hey, I'm here. Um, so uh, yeah, that that's that's what I listen. And then it, it varies. I'll get into something and then I'll, I'll drop it. I, I read Obama's autobiography recently, which I loved as well. I mean, I'm a massive fan of Barack Obama. So um, so that was great read. He writes beautifully as well. Yeah, but I, it kind of, I flip around into different places. And then now and again, I go down YouTube rabbit holes. Uh, interestingly, often about physics uh, and chess. Okay. I love watching I love watching Magnus Carlsen play chess because he commentates on himself, which is super interesting. And it's very often weird that you get, you know, the greatest person of all time or pretty much in a specific discipline doing that discipline and then commentating on themselves. It's really fascinating. I mean, yeah, you don't get, I like you don't thinking get, about that. 
Yeah, you don't get Djokovic saying, right, and now I'm thinking about uh, hitting my forehand. Like, it's very unusual. So that's kind of fun. And, and I've got more into physics since I don't study it than I was in my 20s, for sure. Makes sense. And so, so my last question for you, you kind of answered a little bit of it. So it will hopefully be a little bit more challenging uh, to answer because you just shared a lot of interesting information that I didn't know about you when I looked at your LinkedIn profile. So my last question to you is, can you share with us today something that we're not able to find out from what you've already shared with us on this interview? And if we were to go ahead and look at you on LinkedIn, what we wouldn't know? Power pause. I guess, um, I guess uh, I'll, I'll hint back to some of the earlier, earlier stuff. Something that people wouldn't know about me is that um, it's taken me quite a long time to get to love myself, actually. Um, uh, I'm, I, I irritate myself. I find myself irritating and annoying. My lack of discipline and like, absolute kind of I'm not because I'm kind of a little bit more create on the creative side I would say I'm not like the most organized most details oriented person that I don't like that about myself there's plenty about me that I really don't like um and and I try to kind of work on that and improve that but increasingly the bits of me that work especially at in business actually and being able to kind of bring people along and and create a great culture and there is a great culture in Brandwatch that part of me I like. And so I'm beginning and, and I'm like, and I'm learning to love the bits of me, which I like more than hate the bits of me, which I don't like whilst trying to work on the fact that I'm a pale male and stale and uh, need to evolve uh, as we all do male, white men in our fifties. So I think, I think that journey of learning to love yourself and learning to accept yourself is something that I've been on throughout my life actually. I think that is some wise words. And I want to thank you, Giles, today for really getting radically transparent with me uh, on a, an array of different topics. And you did ask. <laughs> I did ask, right? But what's that? If you don't ask, you'll never know, right? So why not? Um, so thanks so much, Giles. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we look forward maybe to having you back on another episode. We can do some micro episodes off of some of those topics. But thank you so much for your time today. And we wish you the best of luck in your new role and building out those teams. Thank you, Jen. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for tuning in to the Radically Transparent podcast brought to you by Octopost, the only social media management and employee advocacy platform architected for B2B. I'm Jennifer Gutman, your host and director of social strategy here at Octopost. And if you love today's show, we'd love if you subscribe, rate, and give a raving review wherever you get your podcasts. For more discussion on B2B social media marketing, be sure to follow Octopost on LinkedIn. And of course, to gain access to all our free social media marketing and employee advocacy resources, head on over to our website, www.octopost.com. Until next time.